Ben um, and everyone who just joined in. Thank you so much for volunteering your time with us and for attending and supporting our clean water mission. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to BWA board member, Mr. Daryl Spiker. There we go. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I don't want to take up a lot of people's time today. It is so gorgeous out there, yeah. right? Spring, we want to be outside enjoying the creeks, but we also want to be vigilant stewards of our water resources. Um, so I will move on um, to the PowerPoint. We do have a PowerPoint presentation. I will uh, very quickly demonstrate uh, how we go about the uh, Streamwatch sampling. And then we will field, you can ask questions like Michelle said, at any time you have a question, type it in the chat um, and Michelle or my wife, Jackie. There she is. She's gonna wave her arms at me because um, those of you that know me already, I have a tendency to start rambling and then she'll wave her arms and say, get back on task. So let's move to the PowerPoint. Slideshow. Come on, slideshow. From the beginning. All right, everyone seeing the PowerPoint okay? Very good. Um, so yeah, the Broadhead Watershed Association. Before I go any farther, I just want to say that um, my wife Jackie and I have been very fortunate, very, very fortunate to have had the opportunity to work in different parts of the country, primarily for nonprofit organizations, conservation, environmental nonprofit organizations, the Audubon Society in, in Maryland, the Audubon Society in Rhode Island. And we have had uh, occasion to work closely with watershed associations or watershed groups in these various regions. And there we have never worked with a group more organized or dedicated or focused than the Broadhead Watershed Association. Um, the Broadhead Watershed Association recognizes how incredible uh, the resource base we have here is in the Poconos. I mean, we really do have some of the finest freshwater ecosystems on the planet. They're not just the Poconos or Pennsylvania. Right? You have naturally reproducing populations of brook trout in your streams. That is a resource worth protecting. And so the BWA is all about getting out and... Oh, there we go. I couldn't find the little button to move the slideshow ahead. So, so the question becomes then, would you like to become a stream watcher? What happened here? Why did it do that? All right. So I thought that was the last slide, not the second slide. Anyway, I just fixed this slideshow three days ago too. So the BWA was founded in 1989 for a really quick history. For those of you that have lived in the Poconos your whole life, you understand uh, the development pressure that we were under in the uh, 70s, 80s, 90s. We were one of the fastest growing counties in the entire country. Um, population was just exploding and it was causing strain on our resource base and especially our water resources. So the Broadhead Watershed Association had their first meeting as a group in 1989. And one of the things that they recognized right off the bat was the fact that we need to have a strong sense of what the condition of our streams are right now. And they set out to establish a stream watch program, what they are calling a stream watch program. And basically what they wanted was eyes on the streams. They recognize that we do have this fantastic resource base, um, places where people like me, when we were kids, I mean, I spent most of my summers in the creeks here in Baird Township. Um, and so 
uh, they set out to establish a stream watch program. And it, it really was to get as many people out on the streams as they could. Why? Why the need to document what the conditions were like? The reason is that once impairment has occurred to a stream, it's hard to really argue that it wasn't always like this. It's only anecdotal if you just say, but I remember when it wasn't like this. Um, that's fine to say, but that's strictly anecdotal information. And so they wanted to establish a very, very strong baseline data set on what the conditions of the streams are. So that's 31 years ago, BWA started this program. And they didn't just do it, you know, with a group of people, a group of very passionate people that sat around and said, well, we should look for this or we should look for that. They went to the experts. They went to the people that knew what we should look for in the streams. And so uh, Penn State Cooperative Extension, ESU, um, there's a program out of a local university called Alarm. Um, uh, care citizens uh but anyway anyway they got they went to all these people and all these people said this is what you should do first and so the first two tests that we ever did were simply ph and temperature now a lot of people are surprised to learn that temperature can be a pollutant but if you have high quality cold water fisheries like cold is key um, and temperatures that exceed 70 degrees Fahrenheit in our streams are a pollutant, and they are going to ne negatively impact the, the biology, the life of that stream. So the first two things that we did were pH and temperature. Um, it's also important to know that pH is a critical component of healthy streams. Like there is a range at which uh, most life, the function of most most life can occur. And what really happens when pH and temperature get out of balance is that proteins within our cells, proteins become denatured. And what that means is they lose their shape and structure. And for cells to recognize what a protein is and how it's supposed to work, it's all about its shape. And so once proteins start to become uh, denatured, then life uh, is not going to, it's not going to continue. Um, a few years later, they decided that uh, they needed to look at nutrient loading in the streams. So some of the biggest impacts to streams are going to be nitrates and phosphates. And the reason for those two nutrients is that they are limiting factors to plant growth. So when you see ponds and lakes and streams around here that have excessive algae growth and other aquatic vegetation growth, they are getting way too many nutrients. Um, so nutrient loading can be a real problem for streams. Again, it's one of those situations where they are beneficial, right? Plants need nitrates and phosphates, but too much of a good thing turns into a bad thing. And since those early beginnings in 1990, the BWA Stream Watch is one of the most effective stream, volunteer stream watch programs in the state. Um, and I also have evidence to back that up. The William Penn Foundation in Philadelphia has been concerned with water quality, um, especially down in southeastern Pennsylvania for quite a while. And they finally realized that they had to start looking north of the Delaware Water Gap, that their water ultimately comes from up here they wanted to reach out to organizations like the BWA and, and try and help other communities get uh, Streamwatch programs like this off the ground. So they actually used the BWA Streamwatch program as a model. And my wife, Jackie, and I went all over upstate New York, um, Pike County, uh, Wayne County. We went all over the place training people on the methods that the BWA used for their Streamwatch program. It is now um, well over 100 sites get sampled in the county and at least 70 volunteers. So how is the program structured within the BWA? Well, the BWA has board of directors and one of the committees 
is the stream watch committee. And so it has a coordinator or the chairman of the committee. And there's one coordinator that's responsible for making sure that uh, all of the team leaders have everything that they need. And they meet on a regular basis to talk about what issues are in their sub watersheds for each team. So the coordinator deals directly uh, is that li liaison between the board of directors and the team leaders. There are seven teams in the Broadhead watershed. The Broadhead watershed encompasses 239 square miles of land, uh, mostly in Monroe County, a little bit in Green Township, Pike County, but that's quite an area. And so in order to have an effective stream watch program, we've divided the watershed into seven sub watersheds. Each sub watershed has a team leader. And the team leader is the person that works directly with the volunteers that go out onto the streams. Um, which I just said, there you go. Uh, we do hold volunteer training. Now I want everyone to understand that after you're done watching me um, go through the, the protocols of how we do each sampling or, or each test when we do water quality sampling, you will, that's not the only training you're ever gonna get. You're not gonna watch some you know crazy guy with a beard on a Zoom session go, ah, look, there's water quality. Um, we will go out with you in the field. Uh, your team leader will go with you the first couple of times to get you comfortable with how to go about uh, doing the stream watch program. But we do have an annual training session and this is it. So thank you guys for coming. And ultimately what we want are eyes on the stream. And the reason that I say that is as important as it is for us to develop this baseline data that you are, if you feel that you can commit time to doing this, that you will be contributing to um, our data set. Uh, it is important to know that our information is very strong in, in our ability to do certain things, but we are not gonna meet regulatory standards. Our data cannot be used by DEP to make an enforcement uh, against a polluter. But what it can do is get DEP to look more closely at a situation. And DEP will use our information then to go out and do their own sampling. Um, so eyes on the stream. These are the seven sub watersheds that the BWA has divided the watershed into. Um, and I'll start, see if I can get my cursor. Can you guys see my cursor when it's on the screen? All right. So this is the upper broadhead team. Um, it's often mostly just referred to as the Barrett team. So this is Barrett Township. This is the small part of the watershed that creeps up into Pike County. Um, if you're familiar, this is Lake in the Clouds. So Lake in the Clouds community is in the Broadhead watershed. Uh, this is Skytop's property over here. Um, so the watershed starts up here in Barrett Township. Uh, these are the headwater streams, the middle branch of the Broadhead Creek, the Levitt branch and the Buck Hill Creek. And basically where the three of those streams come together in Canadensis, Pennsylvania, is where the Broadhead Creek starts. So where does the Broadhead Creek really start? This is where it becomes known as the Broadhead Creek right here. And it's gonna go all the way to the Delaware Water Gap. Um, so the, the Upper Broadhead team ends where the Paradise Creek joins the Broadhead. So this purple one over here, this is the Paradise team. And the Paradise team is going to include um, Devil's Hole, uh, Yank, Tank and Yankee runs, and then Tank and Yankee, where Tank and Yankee come together, it becomes the Paradise Creek. Um, and Paradise Creek is going to flow all the way until it joins the Broadhead in Analomic. We also get uh, Forest Hills Run that comes out of Mount Pocono in the Paradise team, and we get Indian uh, Indian Run, which comes down out of Pocono Summit and joins the Swiftwater Creek. And the Swiftwater Creek goes through the Sanofi uh, Aventus property, uh, Aventus Pasture, 
I almost called it national drug. Oh my God, that's dating myself. Um, and so that those are all the major uh, streams there in the paradise. Uh, the green one is the Pocono Creek. And the Pocono Creek picks up Scott Run, uh, dry sawmill run that comes out of Crescent Lake. So if you're familiar with where Crescent Lake is, up on top of the top of the plateau, um, Camelback, Camelback Mountain is right in here. So Camelback's in the watershed. Um, the Tannersville Cranberry Bog. So Cranberry Creek feeds into the uh, Pocono, and the Pocono is going to make it all the way down to Stroudsburg, where it joins. The McMichael, this is the McMichael Creek, and the McMichael Creek is going to pick up the Appenzell um, and uh, streams out through the West End, and it's going to join, Pocono is going to join it right before it joins the Broadhead Creek down here in East Stroudsburg, Stroudsburg. So this blue area here is what we just call the lower broadhead teeth. So the lower broadhead um, starts in anilomic and it's going to pick up um, what we're calling reservoir run in East Stroudsburg. And it also gets all of the flow then ultimately from Pocono and McMichael Creek is gonna end up here in the lower broadhead the peach colored section over here, this is Marshall's Creek. So this is gonna pick up everything in Marshall's Creek and it enters the broadhead in um, Shawnee. So it actually gets the effluent from Shawnee's uh, wastewater plant actually ends in here. Um, Although the creek that runs through Shawn, uh, Shawnee's golf course is not part of the, the broadhead watershed. So Shawnee itself is not in the watershed, but um, we do pick up their effluent. Uh, Rock 10, the paper um, plant is right down here. And then uh, this maroon section at the bottom is the Cherry Creek. So if you live in the Cherry Valley, um, the Cherry Creek is not technically part of the Broadhead watershed because the Cherry Creek is going to make it into the Delaware all on its own without joining the Broadhead. But it's also a watershed that only encompasses um, something like 40 square miles. So not a large enough population base there to have their own watershed association. So they actually came to us and said, can we be part of the BWA? Uh, and we said, sure, why not? So the more the merrier. So those are the sub watersheds, uh, the six sub watersheds of the Broadhead Creek and the Cherry Creek watershed. They all have team leaders. Well, yeah, uh, Delaware Water Gap is right here. <laughs> so um, where the Broadhead ends is the Delaware Water Gap, or just above the Delaware Water Gap. Um, Cherry Creek goes right through uh, the borough of Delaware Water Gap. So, uh, if you live in any communities within that area, um, you have a team already. There's a team out there waiting for you to, to get involved and help out. So what are we going to do? I like this picture just because it's a reminder of why we're all doing this. Right? Uh, this is the Upper Falls at Buck Hill. Um, what you're going to get as a stream watcher is a kit, whether you get a kit entirely for yourself or not, um, kits are primarily shared within teams. And that's something that the team leader is responsible for, right? As a, as a volunteer stream watcher, it's your job to get out on the stream. It's the team leader's job to make sure you have what you need to do that. So you let the team leader know, I'm ready to go sampling, I need a kit. Um, and the stream, uh, the team leader will reach out to other members in the team and say, I need a kit from somebody uh, so, so that uh, Jackie can, can get out and do her stream watching. There's no need to remember everything that I say today, although I know you'll never forget it. 
um, because each kit comes with the official Streamwatch manual. And in the Streamwatch manual are all of the protocols. The uh, uh, reasoning for why we do it, um, who to call if you're having issues, uh, the justification. And in this, we also discuss our, our quality control and our quality assurance program. Um, we have tried to make this as scientifically valid as we can. So we do have written QAQC um, requirements uh, in the protocols. So this is in your kit. Uh, you're going to get data sheets. And this is also, I'm going to be talking about this one a little bit later, but this is in every uh, kit. And this is basically the who to call when. And if you go out on your stretch of stream and, and you see something that is obviously wrong, something obviously is going wrong, it can be a little bit hard to make your way through the labyrinth of regulatory agencies that exist out there. You know, I saw something, who should I call, right? Your best, your number one call, if you can't think of anyone else, is the Conservation District, right? The Monroe County Conservation District, because they will know immediately who else should get notification. But if you see a fish kill, obviously you want to call the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. Um, you see lots of center like heavy sediment loading you want to call the conservation district um so there is a, a, for, a laminated form in there so even if you throw this in the creek and everything else gets ruined you can still read the who to call because you got to the stream and you were like oh my god you know and then the who to call form will still be legible so that will be in there as well as um data forms Right, I mentioned that. So your data forms will be in there. You don't need to worry about that. Stream leader, stream team watch leader will make sure you get the data forms. All of the equipment that you need is going to be in this box. Um, there are three different uh, hack kits in here for the various uh, water chemistry tests you're going to do. There's also a thermometer uh, for taking water uh, temperature. Uh, we bought all of the thermometers, okay? All of the th thermometers were purchased from Pocono Pool. Um, so they are uh, water temperature uh, thermometers. And we, uh, we were very adamant about making sure that we had temperatures that could accurately uh, record data in stream conditions. Uh, there's... All of the stuff that you're going to need. Now let's do it this way. All the stuff you're going to need for doing your uh, cleaning of your equipment. So there's distilled water, Dawn dishwashing liquid, vinegar. So that's all for making sure your equipment's clean. There is a test for pH. There's a test for nitrates. There's a test for phosphate. So all that equipment is going to be in your box. The uh, the test kits. This is something that you will have to keep up with your um, team leaders about. So if you have a kit and you know the chemicals are getting low, um, then you have to contact the team leader and say, uh, we're gonna need to order more supplies. Uh, waste handling, why is there waste handling? Well, one of the tests that we're gonna do, and I'll go through this, is a nitrate uh, sample, try and determine nitrate loading in the stream. And it requires a cadmium reduction uh, reaction. Cadmium is a known carcinogen, so it's considered a toxic waste. So when you do that test, we just ask that you capture the, the amount of water that you used and leave it in a jar and team leader will take care of making sure that that gets disposed of correctly. And data management, is again done by your team leader. Uh, you record the data in the field and at home, we'll talk about that, on the data sheet. It's the team leader's job to review your data, uh, the, the information you recorded, and make sure it gets sent to the, to the um, chair of the committee. 
So that's the so that's the chain of command for the data, or the what do they call that? Chain of custody. Chain of custody for the data. You take it, you pass it on to the team leader. The team leader uh, reviews it. If they have any comments, they get back to you, or questions, they get back to you, and then they pass it on to the chair. So um, where are our test sites? Well, they're on the screen. How did we originally arrive with test sites? Well, we use the information that we got from the experts. And if we were going to set up a stream watch protocol, we would want to be sampling at the, at the mouth or just upstream of the confluence of every little tiny sub watershed coming in, right? Because that's gonna capture everything that could possibly be going into that. Um, so we did those, we selected points like that, but we also encourage people to go out and sample where they want to sample. If it's in the watershed, that information has value. So we wanted people to say, well, the creek, uh, Mill Creek runs right through my backyard. Can I sample the Mill Creek in my backyard? You know what our response to that is? Absolutely. Sample the Bill Creek in your backyard. We want to know that. We want to know what's going on there. So this is um, someone sampling site. Uh, if you just look at it during the day, you would never know. But oh boy, where is it? It's right here on the Cherry Creek. And how do you go about collecting a water sample? Well, one of the things that's in your kit, of course, and Obviously, you can tell that you have a lot of fun doing this, right? See that guy? He's having a great time. But your kid's going to come with water sampling bottles. The recommendation is that you have one bottle for each site that you test. So if you have two test sites, say, then you have two different sample bottles. Mark them with your sample site number um, so you don't mix, mix them up. Um, but suppose for whatever reason, you're not sure which one is which, which one went to what site the last time I went out there. When you collect a water sample, okay, you're going, and you'll go over this in the field with your team leader when they come out to help you get started. Or I'd be happy to come out and help people get started if team leaders aren't available. But what you wanna do is if you go into the water, now, we're not saying that anybody has to get their feet wet, right? If you don't want to, you can sample from shore. But if you go out into the water, you're going to sample the water upstream of you. You don't want to stand in the creek and then turn downstream and start taking the sample. You might be disturbing sediment in the bottom and collecting that in your water sample. So you don't want to do that. You want to take your sample upstream and you want to hold your bottle below the surface about, you know, depending on how deep the stream is, but you want to be just about two thirds of the way down. Do you want, does it have to be perfectly two thirds of the way down? No, but submerge the bottle about two thirds of the way down and face it upstream. So it's catching the flow, right? Pick it up. Dump it out behind you. Do it again. Pick it up, dump it out behind you. Do it again. Dump it out behind you. Right? Um, it's just standard protocol for any water quality sampling. If you're going to take a water quality sample, you want to rinse the bottle three times. And that way, you know, you've probably gotten rid of any residual, anything that may have been in the bottle before you took the sample for our purposes. There are other kinds of water quality sampling you can do, especially if you're gonna go out and do, um, say, uh, fecal coliform sampling or um, bacterial sampling, stuff like that. There's going to be a fixative, right, in the jar. So you only got one shot at doing that. And I shouldn't go, it's way more information than we need, but anyway. Um, for our purposes, you want to rinse the jar three, rinse the bottle three times, and then you've got your sample. 
when you perform your tests, you're going to bring the samples home. You're going to take water temperature and ambient air temperature in the field, right? As soon as you get to your site, you drop your thermometer in the creek, let it sit there for a little while. You're going to take the air temperature um, and you're going to collect your water samples. The interesting thing about it, you can do the pH test in the field if you want to at the site. The reagent for the pH test is called brythomal blue. It is non-toxic. It's not going to hurt anything. You can do your sample in the field um, and you can not right in the creek, but on the bank, you can pour your test water out on the bank and do it in the field. There are uh, good reasons for wanting to do the pH test in the field. You really want to do it as quickly as possible after you collect the sample pH. Um, because there's, because it's natural water in a creek, there's going to be some biology in that stream. And um, the longer that it sits, uh, the more biological activity that could take place could potentially alter the pH. But if all you're going to do is go out to the stream, collect the sample, bring it back home, that's not enough time for anything to have happened to that sample. It's perfectly all right to do that pH sample at home. And I'm going to demonstrate why you probably want to do it at home. Uh, anyway, the other two tests you're going to need to do at home anyway. So you might as well just do the pH test at home as well. Uh, the pH test. Again, I spoke about this earlier. Uh, for those of you that you know aren't really uh, sure, you know, well, what are the parameters for pH? Well, pH really needs to be in in the streams in the Poconos. Our natural pH in our streams is in the sixes, right? We're going to be a little bit on the um, on the acidic side of the scale. Right? But that's natural. That's a natural condition. As a matter of fact, the natural condition of pure rainfall is about 6.8. Seven is totally neutral. Um, a little bit above seven, you know, like the pH of our blood is what? It's like 7.3 or something like that. So, you know, there's a range that it's okay to be at. And we do have some naturally occurring conditions, especially say, the water in uh, Cranberry Creek at the Tannersville Bog is going to be extremely acidic. Um, and it probably will be below six. But, but that's okay because the life in that stretch of stream is adapted to those conditions. But once we get too far away from, say, the sixes, we're going to really start to have issues um, with the stream. So if you're not getting seven, that's okay. If you're starting to see things in the fours and the nines, that, that's a big issue, right? That's a big issue. Um, it's important to life. Phosphate. Okay, the importance of phosphate testing. Uh, phosphate is one of the limiting factors to plant growth. And the more phosphate that we introduce to our waterways, the more increase there is in algal, algal and plant growth. And what really becomes the issue there is not that they outcompete other life forms um, for oxygen because they're creating oxygen, right? They are photosynthesizing organisms. So they are creating oxygen. But what happens when they all die? That's when the problems arise with gigantic algal blooms. You don't see an issue right away. You just see a, a pond or a stream that's choked with algae big deal. When that algae dies, though, um, it gets consumed by decomposers. The decomposers are living organisms that need oxygen to survive. It's the decomposers that zap the water of oxygen, just deplete it to the point where it's no longer suitable for fish. There's not enough dissolved oxygen. Fish basically uh, suffocate because there's not enough dissolved oxygen left in the water. So that's why phosphates are such an issue. That's why phosphates pretty much were banned from most commercial cleaning products uh, and even private cleaning products we would use at our home. 
And really the interesting thing about phosphates is the reason that they put um, phosphates in them in the first place is because phosphates are what make things foamy. And everybody likes to see all the suds. It's working, it's foamy, it's sudsy. Um, and it's also the reason that in our protocols for maintaining our equipment, we use Dawn dishwashing liquid. Dawn is 100% absolutely phosphate free. There, there's a certain amount of phosphates that they can get away with and still say phosphate free, but Dawn is absolutely phosphate free. And it's also used, Dawn is used whenever you see those um, news clips or videos of teams that are out trying to save wildlife that have been coated in oil during a major oil spill. Dawn is what they wash them in. The Dawn dishwashing detergent is uh, very good. No phosphates in it. So um, I'll show you, I will demonstrate how to do the phosphate test uh, a little bit later. Um, the nitrate test is uh, perhaps the most confusing of the tests and I'll demonstrate why that is. But again, nitrates are uh, limiting factors for plant growth. But nitrates also um, have a toxicity level. Uh, nitrates are not good for human health when they get too high either. So it's one of the things that if you get your well water tested, they'll test for nitrates in your well water. Um, it's also probably an indicator that there may be you know, locally uh, septic systems, you know, on lot septic systems that may not be functioning properly. Um, so nitrate uh, excel, you know, elevated nitrate levels, um, there can be quite a few uh, reasons for that. And again, as it says down here, this is the one with the cadmium reaction. So it is considered a hazardous waste and we need to be careful when we, uh, when we handle that. This is what the data sheets look like. And, um, oops. I accidentally advanced slides when I didn't want to. So when you're out in the field, you know, obviously you have to take the site number, record stream name and location, uh, the date and time, um, just a general description of what the weather was like today. Overcast, cloudy, rainy, um, bright, sunny, whatever the weather was. Uh, then you're going to take air temperature and water temperature. We want to record that in centigrade, Celsius. Um, water level. So this is this right here is one of the reasons why um, our our Streamwatch data, although critically important data, um, is not going to meet regulatory standards because we can't give an exact volume. Now, how many uh, cubic feet per second were passing the site when we took our sample? That's the, that's the, the, um, the units that the state is going to use, the Fish and Boat Commiss com uh, Committee, you know, the USGS at a stream gauge, cubic feet per second passing the site. And that's going to tell them what volume was when we, um, when we were taking the sample. Well, we're not going to try and figure that out. But you know, as the person, I'm just trying to move my cursor and my key. So, but you know, and this is why it's important to have eyes on the stream. You know, if the day you took the sample, the creek was higher than it normally is, or it was lower than it was normal, or if it was, you know, if this is like normal flow for this time of year, this is how much water I expect to see in the creek. So that's all we do as far as flow or volume. That's our only flow measurement. And it's really your eyeballs on the stream. And that's why it's important that we have people uh, familiar with the streams to, um, to go out and do this because you know that kind of thing. Um, we also want you to record the date of the last date of precipitation. So when you're out in the field, um, you know that it rained yesterday, right? Or it hasn't rained in three weeks. So you know that um, color. So we're going to take some qualitative data. Again, things that somebody who's been visiting site over and over and over again is going to notice. The creek is usually not this color. 
right? Uh, the creek usually doesn't have this odor, right? Creek usually doesn't, no, don't taste it. Don't taste the creek. That's not. We can use all our senses, but no tasty. Don't taste the water. Actually, I drank so much of this creek water when I was a kid. But I cannot recommend it, right? You never know when, you know, Yogi Bear was just upstream making a deposit. Um, so those are kind of the, the qualitative data things we want you to do. We want you to look at the stream, give us uh, flow, odor. Um, then the next three are the chemical tests you're going to do at home. pH, nitrate, phosphate. And this last box is just for comments. And you would be surprised at how valuable your comments can be in that section. Especially when people go back and look. Um, Jackie and I ran a bird banding station for the Institute for Bird Populations in the Hill Country of Texas one year. And at the end of every data session, every time you went out, um, you had to keep a journal of everything that was going on there. And it, there was a section in there just for general natural history observations. There was a section on just for comments. And we would take our time and fill all that stuff out. And uh, the Institute for Bird Populations in Point Reyes, California, sent us an, a glowing thank you letter for all the information that we sent them that wasn't height, you know, length, width, weight. Uh, all the information on the birds, we gave them all this other information, which is important to know, right? Even if your observations are just like, I found a wood turtle in the creek today. You know, that's important information to know. Or the, uh, or the cardinal flower was in bloom, you know, stuff like that. All that is important to know. Um, again, I mentioned earlier on that we do have that card, who to call if something's happening. That's if you're in the field, if you're at your creek site and it's like, whoa, all heck is breaking loose, then you want to use that card. Um, but if you did your tests at home and you thought something was out of whack, first thing you want to do is run the test again with the same sample, with the same sample water. Maybe you had a bad reagent from hack. Right? Maybe there was a problem with that. Maybe you did something wrong when you were doing the test. Maybe something went wrong. Um, so you want to do that first. If you get the same reading, go out to the site the following day, take another sample and test that one. Right? Maybe, maybe the sample bottle was contaminated with something. You want to do your due diligence before you call DEP and say, there's something wrong with my creek, I got a nitrate level that was too low, right? So, um, so that's part of the QAQC, right? We wanna make sure that we're doing this right. So ret retry the test. And then in that instance, if you have an issue with the sample test you took, call your team leader first. Don't call DEP, the conservation district. Call your team leader, you know, probably bring the coordinator in, talk about it. You did the test three days in a row. You got the same result three days in a row. Then maybe, or then we'll call BWA, right? BWA will contact DEP to talk about the, talk about what's going on at the stream and what we're finding. So you guys all ready to be stream watchers now? All right. Um, I did say that we were going to uh, demonstrate real quick how easy these tests are to do. Would you like to see the demonstration? All right. Uh, and I'm sorry for how much talking I do. I mean, I just keep talking and talking and talking. Look up at the clock over here and I'm like, oh my God, it's quarter up. Are we going to be more than an hour? I hope not. We can do this. We can do this. Huh? Oh, uh, yeah, we don't need to see the picture. Isn't that a beautiful group of them? All right, I'm going to stop sharing. Okay, here we go. So this is our hack pH kit. All of the kits 
come with a color wheel. So all of our testing is going to be done with a colorimeter. Oh, yep. Okay. Yeah, now you cut off the top of my head. No, that's good. I'll hold everything up in there. But the color wheel is goes into your colorimeter like this, right? And you're gonna use the colorimeter this way. You have two test tubes. So here's our sample water. The test tubes are plastic. Now, I just wanted to show you this really quick. It's going to be kind of hard to see this way, but um, actually, how about if I do this? I knew this folder would come in handy for something. <laughs> um, you notice that there are, there's this um, like fuzzy area in the middle here. So at the base of that fuzzy area, is uh, five uh, five milliliters. And the top of it is 10, and then there's a ring around the very top. That's 20, right? So when you do the, when you fill your test tube for the test, I'm sure I'm gonna have this all over my lap at some point, but what you wanna do is you're going to fill to this bottom line, right? You're just going to fill to this bottom line. Now, I got more than I need in there. You guys are all familiar with how to read a test tube? Got to look at the bottom of the meniscus because water has, oh, water is so cool. It's like the most unique substance in all the universe, right? It has some really cool properties. And one of those properties is called adhesion. So it's water's attraction to other things. And so the water is actually going to want to climb up the walls of the test tube. And so it makes a kind of a U shape inside the test tube. That U shape is the meniscus. So when you're reading a test tube, you want to read the bottom of the U, right? The bottom of the U. So, um, you fill one test tube, you have to fill the other. This is how the colorimeter is going to work. The other one, you want to fill the same to the five mil mark. And now you're going to use your reagent. This is our reagent it's called brythomal blue. And only in one of the test tubes. It's important. It's important that the Water you put in the colorimeter is the same water that came out of the creek, right? Because what you're going to be doing is comparing the color in the test tube to the colorimeter with the water. And it gets eight drops. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight drops of the blue bryothomal blue, comes with a cap, you put the cap on, you swirl it around a little bit, you can see it's changing color, right, it's blue, and so we're going to put it in the colorimeter, but before I put it in the colorimeter, um, there's two holes in the back of the box for the colorimeter, when I put the colorimeter in, You notice that one of the holes is blue and the other one is clear, right? Because the colorimeter, so the side that's blue, you put the water in, the test tube that only has the creek water, right? And then you put the one that you put the reagent in, in the other window. And now you have to try and compare these two shades of blue. You're not going to be able to see it, really. You're not going to be able to see it. But you're looking in these windows. Light is coming through here. And you're going to match the color wheel. And that's why it's important to use the water that came out of the creek. Because sometimes our streams can have a very high tannin content, tannic acid. 
and it might make the water slight, like a very, very, very weak iced tea. Right? So you want to make sure that you're using the water from the creek. You wouldn't want to put distilled water in there. And then at some point, you're going to be moving the wheel and you're going to say, oh, that color matches perfectly. And my water sample is 6.8. Right? That's what my water sample is. So I can say, perfect. It's exactly what I want. Um, this is actually tap water from the Mountain Home Water Company. Uh, and it's 7.3. Guess what? It's exactly the same pH as my blood. I'm not going to worry about it. 7.3, that's okay. Right? If this was my creek, I might be a little worried about 7.3. But what would I do? I'd run the test again. So that's the pH test. That's how easy it is to do. This is why I'm recommending you do it at home with the other tests. You can do it in the field. But as you can imagine, if you're trying to hold this up and match this color with this color, suppose there's a bunch of green vegetation back here. Right? It's better if you could hold it, even if you could hold up a white piece of paper behind it, right? Or something like that. Because if light can be tricky especially if you're getting reflected light off of other surfaces that are changing the color. So I always think that you can do it in the field, but you're better off doing it at home. So that's how easy the pH is. You can read it as soon as you do the sample, you can read it. Um, yes, I will pass these off to Jackie so they're out of my way. The colorimeters come in a plastic sleeve. Um, one of the things you want to do is make sure that you just don't leave your colorimeter like sitting out on the windowsill because the you've got to bleach the color out of the colorimeter and that's going to cause issues. So they come with sleeves, right? I can tell by uh, most of your faces that you know what it was like when you were a kid and you left your record album on the windowsill for a little while. And, uh, um, I let it be my first copy of the Let It Be album I left out. Oh my God. It had a tidal wave, a tsunami wave coming through it. So this one is more interesting. This one right here is the nitrate test. I'm going to do the nitrate test. I'm going to start the nitrate test. And then I'm going to let it sit. And I'm going to do the phosphate test. And then I'm going to read the nitrate. All right, so the nitrate test is a little more complicated, but still piece of cake. Again, you get two test tubes. Um, these are going to re, uh, require the use of a powder reagent. So there's a little pair of scissors in every kit. Oh, and I should also say that every kit comes with cheat sheets in it. Right, so when you open up the nitrate test, there's a cheat sheet in there. It says, what do you do? These are the steps, how to do it. Um, but you're going to fill the test tube the same way, to the same amount, which is nice. All of our tests are five, no reason, until we do the phosphate. But we go up here to five. And if you're having trouble, you know, they say the best way is to flick. You know, just flick your test tube like that. You just want to get drops out. Don't fill the other one yet, right? Because it's what we have to do first. So you take the first one, and there's two reagents. It's a two test, right? Because first, we're going to knock it. Hello. Somebody sharing with us. Um, there's a Nitrover 6 and a Nitrover 3. So the team leader for this team was very nice and marked them very large numbers so you could tell. Um, so right off the bat, it's a little counterintuitive because you use the Nitrover 6. Nitrover 6 is the one you use first. You 
there's supposed to be perforations to make it easy, right? To tear it like that. Don't, don't do it. Use the scissors. Also, don't do the old Karnak, the Magnificent, right? When he ripped open the envelope and went, you don't want to do that to open the envelope. Pinch them and make sure you get all of the powder pillow in there. And then you're going to shake it for three minutes. Why is someone calling me here? It's my day off. Anyway, uh, this is what I recommend for the three minute shake is that you um, put on some good music. Again, I recommend, yeah, what do you think? Can't buy me love, right? Dance around the room, can't buy me love. Ah, you know, shake it good. You got to shake it good. Three minutes. Okay. Well, that was it. Somebody's looking for me. I'm not going to do the whole three minutes. You guys get the idea? Can't buy me love, love. Good. Let it set for a second. <laughs> Alexa. Oh, yeah. If you have Alexa, just go, Alexa, play Can't Buy Me Love. Um, actually, it's like 2.59 or something. So it's close enough to three minutes. You may not have, uh, all of the reagent may not have been used. So you want to let it set for just a second so it can settle. Right? And then you are going to decant from this one into this one. And you don't want the powder. If there is some powder at the bottom, you don't want any, or Right, anything precipitated out of the reaction, you don't want that, you just want. Now you go with the nitrobur three. This one goes in, and now you only have to shake for 30 seconds, right? So again, I recommend the Beatles. Her Majesty is a pretty nice girl, but she doesn't have a lot to say. Her Majesty is a pretty nice girl, but she changed from day to day. I want to tell her that I love her a lot, but I got to get a belly full of wine. Her Majesty is a pretty nice girl. Someday I'm going to make her mine. Oh, yeah. Someday I'm going to make her mine. 30 seconds. Put it in the colorimeter. You want to rinse this one with the creek water three times, right? Put it in. Now this water is going in our um, wastewater, our contaminated wastewater jar. So um, just yeah, just give me one thing over there. So rinse this, put it in the, your contaminated wastewater jar, and then after you've done that, for demonstration purposes and not to keep us here until Tuesday, again, going to get a colorimeter. This one is pink, red and pink. And you put it in here. And just like we did the other time, we're going to read this. The light comes right in through the back. You can let this sit for a little bit. So while that one is sitting, you can get out your phosphate test. Here we go with the phosphate test. Now the phosphate test gives you a really big crate for the phosphate test to come in, but we're not going to need everything that's in here. There are many different tests you can do with this, but we're doing the orthophosphate test. So um, and here again, the stream leader, Streamwatch team leader did this one up. So I have my phosphate powder pillow. This one has the P on it. So um, you know that it's the phosphate and not one of the nitrate ones. Now we're going to start this test 
in this uh, little flask. So rather than using the test tube right away, we're going to use this flask. And the flask gets filled up this time to the 20 mil line. So you can see that it's graduated. So we want to go to 20 mils. And once we get it up there, 20 mils, we're going to add the powder pillow. And now for whatever reason, now you can see the, the residue in the bottom of this vial. This is not shaken. This is swirled. So, James Bond, this morning, Penny, I want that face fake swirled, not shaken. So you have to swirl the phosphate. There's no time limit on this one. What they want you to do, what they say is swirl it until all of the reagent is gone. You'll swirl till your hand falls off sometimes. Sometimes it's just hard. You'll, you'll swirl and you'll stop and you'll be like, ah, swirl it some more. Um, usually the thing with phosphates, I'm going to say this right off the bat. If, if you get a phosphate hit, you pretty much know it right away when you're swirling it. It starts to change blue. It's going to start to change blue. Um, again, I'm using tap water, but oh, actually, look at that. You can see that that I don't know if you can see. Let's see. Let's see if you can see. So there's our nitrate. Does it look kind of pink to you? In real life, it looks it's getting a little bit pink. So there's some nitrates in my town drinking water. So. Um, but now I filled this to the 20 mil. I have swirled it. And this one gets glass test tubes. Right? It also has a colorimeter. And it has uh It has this contraption that goes in here. Um, and this is actually a mirror. Mirror doesn't fall out. All right, there we go. So the mirror is in there now. Um, so the mirror is in there. Color wheel goes in here. I just took the color wheel out. I don't know what I did with it. There it is. Uh, color wheels in. We have glass test tubes for this one. And we're going to, again, now this time we do want to fill it up to the 20. So that's the line at the top. And we should have had 20 in here. To begin with, fill it up, up, up. Yeah, I was a little over 20 because it's a demonstration, but you want to be at 20. Do not put the cap on. Now you're going to fill with the, the sample water again. Again to the 20 mil line. That's the sample water. And um, the reason for the mirror is that, oops. Ah, Ay, 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 ay. I put the mirror in backwards. There we go. Now, this one's really interesting because, and this is why uh, you want to definitely want to do this one at home, is because when you put the mirror in, um, you can't see. I keep setting this thing up wrong. Usually the mirror doesn't pop out of your <laughs> pop out of your thing and fall apart when you open it up. Uh, could I have some assistance from the lovely Jackie? Oh, I'm down here. 
I'm about to saw her in half. <laughs> now, hold this for a second. The mirror needs to go up here. <laughs> the mirror goes up here where it blocks those holes. No wonder it fell off. Now we'll get it right. Now we got it right. Now give me that. Anyway, now what we're going to do is the light comes down through the water column, hits the mirror, and comes through the little windows here. So in rather having direct light come through the back for the comparison, the water needs to come down through the top of the water. And then we read the, the uh, colorimeter of that way. So, and just like the pH and the nitrate, you turn it and turn it and turn it until you until it matches up. Meanwhile, your nitrate sat for its 10 minutes. After you're done with the nitrate test, it's supposed to sit for 10 minutes. It sits for 10 minutes. Now you're ready to read this one. You record your data on the data sheet and um, your monthly commitment to ensuring our waterways stay clean and healthy is fulfilled. Of course, remember to write down all the data. But if you block off, you know, like an hour, you know, an hour and a half for two hours on a Saturday or Sunday and say, this is the time I'm going to do stream watching. Uh, I have known some people that do multiple sites. Uh, one of them was uh, actually a chemistry professor. He would get like all of his test tubes for the nitrate test set up at the same time and bind them all up with a rubber band and he would he just shake them all at the same time. Um, yeah, if you're if you're organized enough, they, I'm not that organized. I'd be like, which creek did this come from? Where did I would have to do them one at a time? But he had a whole system set up where he was doing them over and over again. Um, and and I do want you to know too that the BWA is very serious about their QA, uh, QC stuff. Um, we have had the hack company uh, reagents tested in the lab at ESU to, to try and ensure accuracy that the that the chemicals they're sending us are accurate. So um, so once you're all done, um, you can follow the protocols for cleaning the equipment. You rinse with the uh, distilled water, you wash with the done, you rinse with the vinegar, you rinse with the distilled water again, and it should be good to go for anyone else that's gonna use the kit after you do. Were there any questions, Michelle? Did anybody type? Um, we had a couple questions as we were going that I think we handled in chat. And then Katie just asked just one time a month, one time they're doing water samples a month. Yeah. Yeah. The, we, we asked that you go out at least once a month. And one other thing that I didn't mention. Okay. Two things that I didn't mention. Number one, the night, when you do the nitrate test, the water is supposed to be room temperature. So if, you, if you're doing a sample in January and you bring the water back, don't run the nitrate test right away. Let it sit for a while. Um, if you really want to do it right away, I mean, you could do pH, doesn't matter. You could do the phosphate, it doesn't matter. But the nitrate has to sit a little bit until the water temperature warms up. If you really want to do it sooner than that, you know, put the water in the test tube and hold it between your legs for a minute or two. It'll probably warm it up uh, enough. So the nitrate test, the water has to be room temperature. And number two, more importantly than anything else that we talked about is your safety, right? Volunteer safety really is our number one concern. We want the data, yes, but we don't want, if, it, if it's been pouring rain for three days, right? And you really want it, what's the creek like when the water is high? We don't want you trying to go down to the creek when it's in flood stage. Don't try and get a water sample when it's in flood stage. Let it go for a couple of days. And as a matter of fact, it is better. It is better not to go when there's 
high stream flows due to a storm event. Wait a couple of days until it goes back down again. Because what we are really taking is baseline data on the, the condition of this stream. So we want to know what's the stream like when it's at base flow. Now, we could do establish other protocols where it's like, well, we really want some sampling done when it's at really extreme high flows. Well, number one, um, I would not recommend volunteers go out and do that, but um, you know, there we yeah, we would just definitely have to set up a totally different protocol for how you sample the water, where you sample and what you're sampling for. Um, if we were doing high flows, because high flows are really going to show us more than just nitrates, uh, probably we would want to do something like conductivity or total dissolved solids or something like that. Um, rather than just nitrates um, uh, or nutrient loaded. So don't go out when it's extreme high flows. And of course, if the banks of the stream where you like to sample are extremely icy, uh, try another day unless you have, you know, unless you're absolutely certain that you can get there. I mean, that there are dedicated people that go out there and break the ice to get their water samples um, if they have to. So that, that kind of dedication is certainly appreciated. But remember, your safety is our number one concern. You will get a StreamWatch card. So if people ask you what you're doing, um, there's StreamWatch card. Some of the sites are monumented. So a few years ago, and I'm old enough now, I know when I say a few years ago, I really mean like 20 years ago. Um, we went around and if property owners were willing, we put up little signs that said, this is a stream, BWA stream watch site. So if people ask you what you're doing there. Um, many of the stream watch sites that already exist are right on roadways, right? Pull up to the bridge, get the sample um, at the bridge. If anyone and again, we have the card, so you could say, well, I'm just a BWA stream watcher, um, but all bridges have PennDOT or municipal right-of-ways to access the abutment and everything. So if you're not really traipsing across a lot of private property, you know, if you pull up to a bridge, you get a sample. Um, but of course, we have to uh, abide by the wishes of the property owners. So you don't want to be trespassing either when you do this. So. Your safety is our number one concern. Um, and uh, any other questions? I think that was really the only thing I forgot to mention. Yeah, I don't see any more questions. I think we're good. I just want to remind everyone that you will be contacted by your team leader for your stream watch area to get your site assigned, um, schedule more on stream training, and coordinate getting equipment and supplies. So be on the lookout for that. And thank you so much for volunteering your time with this valuable program. Yes, thanks so much for joining us today. Now go outside. Yeah, I think with that, we can wrap it up. I think we're good. <laughs>